and this slide shows uh, uh, something uh, that I did with Mark Batashny. Uh, where's the pointer on this? Oh, here it is. Uh, in uh, 1975. So in 1973, um, Mark and I uh, had the great fortune of uh, going to the MRC and working with Fred Sanger. And at that time, uh, this was two years before Sanger sequencing had been developed, and Fred was uh, uh, experimenting with various approaches. And we used one of these approaches, and uh, maybe only Shankar will know what this is, but it's called the running spot method. And that is that you take single-stranded DNA, uh, this five prime labeled, you degrade it uh, partially with a nuclease, and then you run two, something called two-dimensional homochromatography. And the pattern of the jumps between each uh, nucleotide, uh, you can read the sequence off. And so, for example, you can take this fragment, cut it, have four pieces, and it checks it against each other because you're always sequencing both strands. So that's what we use for this. Uh, and that uh, in 1973, we published a paper um, with 27 nucleotides. That was the, that was a nature paper. Uh, it was, it was uh, uh, one of the uh, operator regions. So I'm showing this because uh, this was, uh, the sequence was done in 1973. Uh, this was, I, I went back to Harvard and, uh, and finished this. But uh, a month ago, there was a anniversary of the 50th, the 50th anniversary of recombinant DNA at Cold Spring Harbor. And uh, of course, that was 1973. So we cloned the first uh, full length cDNA clone in 1975. And uh, so it was only two years from uh, the invention of recombinant DNA that we actually had uh, a full length double strand cDNA. So I am, as the program indicated, I'm uh, going to try to walk through this quickly, uh, which is uh, Axel, uh, Richard Axel has this term for th things that are really interesting, and he's always called this a fascinoma. And it's a fascinoma because uh, of its organization and the complexity uh, of its regulation. So uh, in, this was in 1999. And uh, we were working on uh, the mechanism of uh, regulated splicing. And uh, Chong Wu uh, had just come to the lab uh, after receiving his uh, PhD at Cold Spring Harbor with Adrian Craner. And of course, Adrian uh, was also a f uh, one of my former students. And we were looking for a locus to study alternative splicing. And I won't go through how we got there because uh, it'll take too long. But anyway, we landed on this. And uh, Chung Wu uh, began using the DNA that was being deposited from the Genome Project uh, and uh, using uh, the, the exons that had been reported by uh, Taiichi Yagi as a protein that is expressed. Uh, in neurons with no known function. So uh, Chang Wu is able, by using this very early crude bioinformatic uh, approach, to uh, assemble this million base pairs of DNA. And the remarkable thing is that when end-to-end uh, -end chromosomes are finally sequenced, it's, it's accurate. Uh, it's completely right, which is uh, uh, which is remarkable. So, uh, so this was, uh, we identified this and started working on it uh, intensely to try to understand uh, what it does. And I'm going to tell you about the, its function uh, first uh, because this is uh, obviously really important. So uh, uh, a critical issue uh, in uh, building a brain is uh, the establishing the neural circuits. And there are a number of important issues in this, but two of them are uh, neurite self-avoidance. Oops. Uh, 
uh, it's uh, neurite self-avoidance. And what that is is that the neurites of an individual neuron cannot self-synapse. They have to avoid each other. And so that's self-avoidance. And another phenomenon that's really important is tiling. Tiling is where you assemble a series of uh, functionally identical neurons, uh, such as uh, shown here for Purkinje cells, and that they're stacked and paced in such a way that they interact with each other, self versus non-self, but of the same type. So uh, this problem uh, was solved by uh, Larry Zabersky first in Drosophila, in which he showed uh, another set of genes called DSCAM are responsible for this. And I won't go into uh, that, but there's a really interesting evolutionary split between invertebrates and vertebrates that solve the same problem with different genes. So uh, after a lot of work, uh, this is uh, how the, the sort of roadmap for this locus turned out. And um, what you see here, gosh, I got to stop doing that. Um, so what you see here is uh, the, uh, there, gosh. So there are three clusters, alpha, beta, and gamma. And these uh, colored rectangles each indicate uh, a gene. And these genes, unlike almost all other cadherins, have no introns. Uh, they're very long uh, single intron, uh, single exon uh, uh, constructs. And uh, as you can see, uh, they're protocated alpha, beta, and gamma. And uh, what's important here, they're, they're so-called variable genes, uh, which are, are randomly chosen in individual neurons. And these, uh, these other genes, which are actually regulated uh, in neurons, I'll tell you about that in a moment. Uh, and they have the five prime ends here, but then uh, they have uh, exons which include, which encode the intracellular domain. And that's true for alpha and gamma. Uh, beta has no intracellular domain, which is interesting. They're absolutely uh, conserved in evolution and they function, but they don't have a signaling component. They, they must have their signaling component from alpha or gamma. So just to, uh, again, uh, to explain uh, their importance. So obviously, there are 80 billion neurons in the human brain. They have to be arranged in circuits that are fully functional. So that's obviously a very complicated problem. Uh, individual neurons, as I said before, uh, really have to distinguish between self and non-self. Uh, as you see here, they can't get entangled in a way that they're not functioning. And then uh, this issue of tiling, which I mentioned before, uh, and you see that beautifully in Purkinje cells and in, uh, in the retina, starburst amarcan cells is, have this beautiful display of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of neurons. Now, uh, this is how they're expressed, and uh, it's complicated, but uh, you can see that each of the two uh, homologous chromosomes are independently stochastically expressed. So you're sort of doubling uh, uh, the variation by, uh, by this means. And uh, so, for example, you'll see on a maternal chromosome, you'll have this alpha-5 here. Uh, you express uh, these two C types, uh, maybe one beta, one gamma. And so independently, random choices are made on the two chromosomes. And that leads to a, uh, a transcript. And by, uh, by uh, always choosing the five prime splice site for the expressed uh, exon, you generate a messenger RNA that has this variable exon nine and constant uh, exons, and the protein uh, looks like this. Now, uh, the protein uh, 
have to form a dimer to get to the cell surface, and they can uh, more or less randomly make any alpha, beta, gamma uh, to do that. So you can see from this that uh, it really generates uh, a lot of complexity. Now, if you look at different cell types, they display different patterns of expression. So you see here in uh, olfactory sensory neurons, it's the, the pattern that I mentioned in the previous slide, pretty much random selection uh, from individual exons in the three clusters. And so uh, this is what you see in uh, three different uh, neurons. Purkinje cells uh, are similar, uh, that they, uh, they choose uh, genes from each of the three clusters and uh, they, they express uh, that, that you'll see in a moment they're required for self-avoidance there. And then uh, a really interesting example, which I'll get into, is that in serotonergic neurons, basically the only thing that's expressed there is protocid here in alpha AC2, uh, which is, you'll see, critical for serotonergic wiring. Uh, pretty early on, we began characterizing uh, the, uh, the enhancers that are uh, responsible for this regulation. And you can see here that uh, the main enhancers here, are HS51 and HS7, uh, they regulate uh, the alpha cluster. And they were identified by uh, DNA hypersensitive before a tax seek and, um, and tested in mice. They were, they were put upstream from a reporter gene and uh, to show that they actually function. Uh, there's an enhancer here that uh, acts on protocate here in beta, and then a set of enhancers that are similar to ones here that are acting on both the C-type gammas uh, and uh, the gammas. Now, um, so if we focus on the alpha cluster, it looks like this. You have an HS51 uh, enhancer, and uh, here are the, the variable regions. Here's AC1 and AC2. And uh, I should say all through this over the years, we sort of collaborate on and off with, uh, with, with Chung Wu, and uh, some of the work that I'll describe are uh, part, of that, uh, part, part of that collaboration. So uh, what was found is that uh, within uh, the alternate exons here, there are two CTCF binding sites uh, uh, located, uh, one in the, uh, in the promoter and one in the exon. And uh, the enhancer, which is several hundred thousand nucleotides away, uh, HS51, has uh, also CTCF binding sites. And one of the important things that uh, Chung Wu noticed uh, in our collaboration is that uh, uh, genome-wide, and this was independently done at the Broad, uh, are always in offset orientations. They have to be uh, in offset orientations to work. And so what happens then is that you see looping between 5-1 and alpha-12 here, uh, and we, you know, this was all uh, confirmed in the ways we, we know. Um, so. Uh, Daniela Canzio, a, a postdoc who's now at UCSF, and I'll talk about some of his work in a minute, independent work, uh, did this experiment, which was ver very revealing. So he did the standard RNA polymerase synchronization uh, experiment, uh, where this is the five prime, uh, the five prime cap. You use DRB to synchronize the RNA polymerase. You wash the DRB out. You add uh, thio U. And, uh, and then uh, let it go, and then isolate the RNAs. And this is what uh, he was able to see, is what you can see in this particular cell line, it's, produ it's producing alpha 4, 8, and 12. And uh, you can see that in addition to the transcripts in the sense uh, direction, uh, there are also transcripts in uh, the opposite direction. Uh, and so anti-sense RNA uh, is initiated from within the exon going the wrong direction. Uh, and this, this just shows 
uh, RAD21, CTCF, and uh, H3K4, trimethyl. So to try to understand uh, what go was going on there, a whole series of experiments were done, were published a few years ago, and I don't have time to go through them, but this is basically uh, the interpretation, and that is that uh, you have the HS5 enhancer, uh, cohesin binds, and by loop extrusion, uh, continues across uh, the cluster. And what you see is that uh, in the stem cell, uh, all of the promoter sites, both sense and anti-sense, uh, are, uh, are methylated and off. And what happens then is that, as you saw in one of the previous slides, there's an anti-sense transcripts that is initiated from in, within the exon and it extends upstream. And it can go thousands of nucleotides. It's just a standard link RNA. Uh, but what happens is that uh, with increasing amounts of TET3, it's uh, the transcription of link RNA through the methylated upstream promoter leads to its demethylation. The binding of CTCF and cohesin and uh, activation of transcription, and that's shown here. So this is like the, the form at which uh, uh, a, a chosen gene is activated. And so the, the alternative uh, forms that are selected are this complex process of dealing with methylation and random uh, activation. So um, now, uh, this year in science, uh, Daniele Canzio, is who I said is a is a assistant professor at UCSF, did a whole series of beautiful experiments that uh, I c you can refer you to this paper, and uh, this is done entirely in his lab. Of course, we talk all the time, but uh, this is really his work. So, um, what you see is that uh, here's the HS51. Uh, and you can see that uh, in this direction, you, uh, and there's another enhancer here, which I, I, I won't talk about, you activate AC2. And that's all you act, uh, interact, because now the enhancer is occupied with this. However, uh, it's, uh, what you also see is that with cohesin, you see stochastic promoter choice, uh, which gives cluster-wide uh, enhancer activity, which activates one of the uh, several uh, alpha, uh, particular alpha genes. So uh, what he's been able to show uh, really quite uh, beautifully is that uh, what's going on here is similar to uh, something that Fred Alt talked about uh, in, the, in the immunoglobulin locus, and that is that uh, what happens is that this WAPL, this uh, unloader, cohesin unloader, uh, when it's high, then uh, it, the, as the extrusion occurs from H51, HS51, it stops at AC2, activate transcription, and that's what happens. But uh, you see the alternative that in uh, low levels of WAPL, uh, you see the same thing, but now uh, there's enough activity going through here that it makes it through to these promoters. And because they're all methylated and look identical, it's just the rate of extru extrusion that determines which one of the variable region, uh oh. Uh. <laughs> And so he did this nice uh, experiment here, in which you can see that um, if you map the mean WAPL mRNA levels versus the fraction of proteoglycan and alpha C2, that uh, you start off at a, uh, at a high level and it decreases. So the level of WAPL decreases during OSN differentiation, leading to the uh, decrease in the level of AC2. So these are the these are the intermediates. This is the stem cell for olfactory sensory neurons, and uh, this is the, uh, the mature uh, neuron. Of course, all this thing was done in mice. Uh, uh, Stavros Lombardis is, I share a lab with, and so he's been instrumental in, 
setting this up uh, to be able to do this uh, in the olfactory system. And it turned out to be exactly uh, the right choice. So the bottom line is that, uh, as it says here, WAPL levels in developing OSNs function as a real stat to regulate the balance between determinative and stochastic gene expression. And so uh, at high levels of WAPL, uh, you uh, scan through and you express this whole variety of, uh, of genes, whereas uh, in low levels of WAPL, it stops at uh, AC2 and you only express that. And because I had, I had more, but I'm out of time. But I think this is, uh, this is a, uh, a nice place to stop because it really it, uh, explains this amazing thing about switching from determinative to, uh, uh, to random uh, expression. Uh, I should say that, uh, just as a quick uh, uh, finale, is that uh, I'm not going to show you the slides, but we've had a wonderful structural uh, protein uh, collaboration uh, with Larry Shapiro. And, uh, God, I have these once in a while, these name things, Barry Honig. And uh, those studies identified a completely new structure of proto-cadherins that are dimers. And uh, these are assembled on the membrane in an amazing way as dimers. And uh, when they touch the opposing membrane, they form a lattice. And this lattice really determines whether or not uh, they activate all the machinery necessary for repulsion. So remember, these are not adhesion proteins. They're repulsion. And they repulse by uh, releasing the intracellular domain of the protocadherin. And there are two forms that are generated by alternative splicing. One form goes to the wave complex, which almost certainly is involved in the repulsion part. And the other goes into the nucleus, activates transcription, including protocadherin genes. So it's, uh, it's a, an amazing system. Every, you know, every month we find a, a, a new fascinoma. So uh, I'll, I'll end there. <laughs>